Um, okay, let me introduce Patrick Hogan, uh, Managing Director of Gateway Adopters, uh, discussing market fit fast. Patrick has over 25 years of experience helping teams bringing breakthrough concepts to market quickly. He helps teams avoid the things that kill most new projects, bringing clarity and precision to their vision around customers they target, the problems they solve, what they build, and how they engage their markets, often cutting time to a compelling release by 75% compared to normal practice. Practi uh, Patrick <laughs> has been a founder or an executive at startups and SaaS, ARVR, online media, and consumer services, and led teams in large enterprises like Adobe, M uh, Microsoft, and Av Avanade, Avanade to develop new solution concepts, platforms, and tools. Uh, as a mechanical engineer from UW and an MBA, Patrick enjoys tackling the challenge of bringing together traditional industries with the latest high technologies like analytics, AI, ML, IoT, and XR. Uh, without further ado, Patrick. Thank you and good afternoon. Uh, Today is going to be an interactive day. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the principle, very little bit about the challenges that I kept seeing with my teams and why this concept that we're going to talk about today developed. But instead of spending a bunch of time talking about the details, we're going to jump into an exercise. And I know it'll be challenging. Uh, I actually, the more argument, the better. And so I don't, uh, we're going to do our best, but uh, I really don't want you to stick to the wait till the mic shows up because the more debate, the more you guys jump in, uh, the m m faster you guys learn. So I'm dumping into hands on. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to use some tools I've developed to help you guys think about the kinds of value that you're going to be developing. Um, once we're done and we kind of figure out how, what we're talking about and if people get comfortable with what's going on, I'll, then I'll step back and I'll talk about the theory. Where'd it come from? What's the fundamentals? How does it affect a team? Uh, what are the outcomes? Like I said, almost every team I've engaged where I've gone through a workshop with this, actually not a workshop, any one of their normal planning meetings, I typically cut their time to a release by three quarters. They're just building stuff they don't need to be building now and they didn't know it until we walk through and ask some hard questions. After that, if you guys are interested, I'll call it kind of the after hours session. Um, if you want to learn how it came to be and how I've identified this particular problem over and over and over again and hammered down and refined to create what you guys are going to experience today, I, I, I have time to talk about that. So that's been uh, really where I focused my career, why I left engineering and went and got my MBA is what are these patterns for finding the best practices and, and how do you develop uh, something that can really unleash a team? Um, so before I jump in, are there any kind of burning questions before we uh, jump into the issues? Nope. All right. So as I said, I, I, I've been with many teams. I've done a lot of research into what kills teams and what they trip up on. And you know, as you guys probably know, uh, most new projects fail whether it's, it's amazing VC or uh, enterprise, the failure rates are amazingly similar. If you see anything that says it's better than 85%, uh, uh, then you've got to ask some hard questions because it consistently comes in the 90s as far as new concepts just not landing. And when they look, the pattern for why they fail is actually pretty simple. There's some simple things they don't do. And that's what I can talk about at the very end. But one, this is one where I kept finding it. And uh, it really has to do with trying to figure out where you should focus, and this one happens almost all the time. So uh, we're going to jump in and talk about why this market fit fast model helps, because I kept finding what I call indicators. So I treat my team like a physician treats a patient, and I say there's a process we got to go through, and we know what healthy is for, to be successful, and we know what often ails you, there's like those five things we'll talk about. And these are things that you keep hearing, I kept hearing over and over. And when these were the top things, I spent and focused on time and I filtered out the rest and I thought about these. And do they really know if the problem they're solving is important or not to their audience? And how do they know? Uh, it, does the solution they're thinking about really a clear advantage over what is happening or what the alternatives are? Do they have an answer to that question? Um, 
is it big enough, and I use the word compelling to talk about this, is it compelling enough that, yeah, maybe it's better, but is it big enough to, to spend what's probably more money than the cost of whatever they're doing to stop what they're doing today, change, and move to something else? And research by some people, a guy named Mohan Sani uh, at Kellogg, says it's almost got to be 10 times better in order for people to actually go through the change process. So when you ask these questions, like a doctor asks patient questions, and you're not getting good answers, you start to, uh, bells start to go off. Um, other things that it might be at a management level, are we doing too many cycles and iterating too often before people say, yes, this is right? Is there a conversation about people over-investing in components and saying, do we really need to, I use the word gold plate this thing, or that thing, or they don't really know which one of the things that, that they should be spending their time on? Um, are they building things that people, some people might in the team might say, I'm not sure we need that. I don't know exactly how it aligns. Uh, doesn't mean it shouldn't be. It just means there's confusion and lack of clarity. Um, and then oftentimes, uh, and the thing that I find is the most liberating is they do need to build something, but they're actually just overbuilding it. And this is the, they're gold plating something they, d they don't need to. And so when I hear these patterns, this is where this tool comes out. And it has to do with a, a, a f aligning, uh, getting fit to the market need. And, and here's why it's hard. And this is, again, back to the kept running into it and saying, well, what are tools to solve this? Is It turns out that people in their personal lives think this way. I'm going to talk about it. But they don't apply it in their teams. Is They th think about the value in a product in the fact that there are different types of value not just a linear value of high and low. There are some things that just have to be there. Once they're there, they don't care. I, I in, in the example we're going to do, talk about a family sedan. you got to have tires and wheels on the family sedan. It doesn't have to have Brembo brakes. It doesn't have to have performance rubber. People don't care. So it's required. But once you have it, if you spent more money on it, you've wasted your energy. So that's an example. Interior is a linear. Anyway, so there are different types of value all within the one product. And, and labeling this different type of value so the team can take advantage of that dynamic and help people really value the work they're doing was the challenge that I was trying to face. So and when I was getting into it, why you saw those indicators earlier is the instrument of high and low is just too blunt. It doesn't actually model how people think about what they're paying for, what they want to pay a premium for. Um, and it also locks you into the tyranny, and we'll get into this, the difference between priority and, uh, and sequence. And what happens is when you start using a more accurate language, you can actually change the sequence of what you do to get to your vision and develop value that you doesn't actually align with whatever priority might mean. Um, this is a tool that I've used in Waterfall, Agile. Um, these tools, these methodologies for development are a process. They're how. The tools, this tool and most of the other 47 that I use to help a team think about what they're doing and change how they view what they're doing are what questions. They're what are you building. Lean says, Go think about a hypothesis and go try it. But what hypothesis? How do I develop a hypothesis? And this is a, about one of those ways to get your team on the same page. Um, and it really changes the way teamwork. And I'll talk about that later. So again, starting to jump into the deep end without going into the theory. These are the these are a, these are the buckets of different types of value. So there are kind of two big buckets, and then they break down. There are things that if you just don't have them, they're absent, you don't have a product. The car I spoke of earlier, if it's sitting on blocks, and you have a beautiful interior with automatic driving control, it doesn't work. right? You, you took that must thing that you said, ah, oh, it was low value, and you stopped doing it. I've worked on teams like this where they did, they've done things that they know didn't have value, but they just didn't build it, and it was broken. Um, there are also things that have to be there, and the more the better. And again, the car example, I talk about interior. You know, there are uh, capabilities and uh, fit and finish, soft touch, 
materials that you can lower and raise depending upon your team skills and the market expectations for you that you're going after, and you invest accordingly. Now, the second bucket has, uh, is where the opportunity and danger, real dangers rise. And that is, it's not essential. It doesn't have to be there it, 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 to have a product. You could, this whole side, anything that falls into this, you could not do it. Now, by the way, you wouldn't have anything compelling because you'd only have what the market expected and it's there because other people are doing it. Um, and so then it breaks down into these three categories. It's not expected, but if you do it, even a little of it often, it has value because the rest of the market doesn't expect it to be part of the, part of the solution. And that's where I dig hard to say, is this gonna be compelling? There's two others that you need to dig into, especially if you start hearing uh, customers complain, and I've definitely found these when I got into the rigor, is it doesn't add value and people just don't care. Usually about 10 or 20% of the features, actually, once you get clear about the customer, people have in the backlog that you just don't have to build. And others were which, if you build it, someone in the ecosystem will be ticked off and kill it. Usually they're decision makers. There are people who are worried about downside risk and control and governance and things like that where they have some, hey, if things hit the fan, you know, you gotta worry about it. And so you have to go in and, and look at what that is. Let me don't do the feature, by the way. It just means you have to figure out how to address it. So those are the five uh, areas. And to give an example, I'm gonna share, uh, actually uh, one of my friends who might, might play the Vanna role uh, has joined. He put this together because his uh, w he and his wife lived in Fremont, and they apply to even the most simplest to the most sophisticated. Now, the more sophisticated, the more the language helps, but if you want to pick a barista in Fremont, and you're looking at all your choices, they gotta do hot. It's gotta be there in hot, and we, most of us know, you know, what hot enough is. Over that, you don't have to worry about it too much. You, you could get too hot, but good enough. So that's a must. Then there's flavor, and what shops are showing is, yes, you can get, pay, get people to pay more and get more revenue, but it's not typically compelling or differentiating because in the end, most baristas get their coffees from the same sources, and they don't have wildly unique. They can pay, charge you more for something. Um, and then uh, my friend's uh, wife picked uh, Foam Art as her delighter. That's what made her pick the artist that she picked because she knew she could get a hot, good cup of coffee. Uh, um, and also, she didn't care about color of the cup. It doesn't matter. She didn't, that, that's not part of the equation. The provider may do it for branding. So, the challenge is, how do I get a team on the same page if they're gonna start thinking about this? So that's one of the things that uh, actually Mauricio and I experienced when we were working and using these concepts on a big project where it created a new API for Office. And that is, you know, you've got a people in a room, how do they agree? So you're actually, you're changing, you, you guys heard of thinking in new boxes, not, not out of the box, but if you're gonna work in a group, you gotta get out of one box and into a new box that everyone agrees what that box is. And so this is a tool we developed or experienced and to get a, a group into another box of thinking that unlocked, uh, how they thought, and actually someone who's been through this, a professor here at the UW saw it and he says, yeah, it suddenly had a language that, that went across all the different functions. That's what he was seeing happening when, uh, during this shop. So they came to an agreement across functions. Now, what we're gonna do now is uh, we're gonna play that experiment. You guys have a, a workshop kind of thing. You guys have on your desk a target customer and you have who they are. Now I spend with a lot of time with my team talking about this and working this through and almost any time a team does that, they, they get it wrong. Uh, and that's okay. We go through it and we find out that different people on the team think they're going for, in this case it would be more kids than two or didn't, have a, didn't know they had a minivan so that when they needed everything they, they really could use the minivan or there's aspects that I learn as we walk through it. But that's the target, and then we have a backlog. Now, I could, th in this workshop, I've done it, uh, or this model is, uh, I've done it for remodeling a house. I, I've had people who've done this and gone home and, and thought about their house, remodeling their kitchen, uh, 
investing in a product portfolio. So you'll be able to actually think about each of these. We think about features, but they, were, they abstracted it up and said, oh, I've got 10 products. Which one should I do? And then the one that was most interesting is one of the uh, people we worked with, uh, he was brought up by a single mom and he got married. He goes, I, I don't know what it means to be a good husband. And so he used these models to say, I want to delight my new bride once a week. And so I have to figure out what that is and how do I you know, adjust what I do to make sure I can do that. But today we're just gonna, we're gonna look at the backlog on a car. So you guys have uh, the target. Um, it's a f we're looking at building a family sedan. And the family is four people, mom, dad, two young kids, seven-ish. Um, they have a minivan. So when it takes, everyone's gotta load up and go on a trip or they're going to soccer games and they're all together, they have that need met. But there's other needs. The kids are getting bigger, or they might have a friend or two. They don't have to carry all the equipment, but they want to go somewhere. Uh, the, the father has got to let go of his two-door sports car, so he's going to sell that off. We know that that's going to happen. And so how do you want to uh, make this, uh, get a product that actually appeals to this scenario? Uh, so that's why you see the, the uh, description I have. So for head of household who's replacing a car, a sports car, um, they're going to sell it. Uh, he needs to carry one child who's seven years old, so oftentimes the back seat's really important. Um, but he doesn't carry, have to carry the full load. They insist on five-star rating. It's got to be under the typical market price, which is uh, transaction, which is now a little bit over 33K. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to walk through this tool and answer the question for the backlog. Um, and you see the backlog. So these are the things that a team would say, okay, I got to build this thing. And here's where um, I'd like to now that we, we break down a little bit and I'm going to ask you guys where you think th these components are. And so, um, does anybody want to pick uh, a feature? And we're going to debate where you think it belongs on the decision tree, where we'll walk through each one and we'll say, first, is this thing expected? So this gets you into the first two buckets. And then for the one side of the decision tree is, OK, does it add more value? And if it does, it goes into the must, which will put it at the bottom. If it is expected and uh, more value than the basic will add more, you know, we can get more out of it and keep investing. Uh, we'll put it in the linear, so that's where we'll put it. And if it's not expected, but it does add value, we'll put it in the delighters. And also we'll have some conversation. We have the bailout conversations for um, if it's, uh, they don't care. Maybe there's some products, if you pick a niche, there's things that you thought were important, suddenly, hey, they don't matter, or they might, m might find it a problem. So what I've done on the, on the side is, is to try to give a representation of how a customer values the work you're going to do to create that thing. Does that make sense? So the must is, once it's there, you could work on it and keep working on it, but they don't care. The linears are, it has that same dynamic, but the more you do, the better. There's got to be a point where you, you got to cut it off. Delighters are, if it's there, hey, it's up, and you've got lots of opportunity. Indifferent, I don't care. You can do lots of work. It's not going to change anything. That's a button that has nothing connected to the other end. And there's indifference where you have to make sure that you don't pick somebody off. So when I talk about how a customer values and the type of value, those are the buckets. These are the things that blow up the concept of a linear high and low. It just, it, it, why a linear high and low becomes such a mess? Because it just doesn't acknowledge that there's some binary components and negative components. And again, we can talk about where that comes from uh, later if you want. So uh, anybody want to pick the first backlog item? And we'll start, we'll put it uh, down, the, down the process. <laughs> All right, great. So. Um, if, if you want to find it in, find it in there, okay. let's see, it's, uh, so, expected? 
Yes, tires and wheels is the first thing we're going to talk about. So, expected? Yes. yes. Okay, so we're going to go down the, down, the, down the track where actually most of the backlog ends up. And so this next conversation becomes important. So can it add value beyond just having a base? Question? Yes? What's your argument? Okay. Any, any, what's that? You don't think? Well, okay. So expected, so at that point, it would, what it would have said, so to add value to tires, you would have to be very compelling that the indicated tires are so much better than the ones that are indicated. Right? Well, tires and wheels, right? So it's, it's a system. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so. Yes, and now I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask this, and which is what I do with my team all the time. Now look at the profile again and look at that persona and say, what do you think they'll think? Yes. Yes. Yes, what's... Yep. So, you're arguing, and... By the way, I'm, I'm going to be biased right now. I know that you argue. So I'm going to say, this guy drives a sports car now. He loves handling. If you were to put economy car tires on there, that's just not acceptable. His binary of that's good enough for me to even shop for that car, he would just say, no, that's, that you're not making it. So there, you've got to be somewhere on the linear category. So in, in my mind, the, the, it's at least a linear, in my mind. Do so you guys strong objections? And we'll move on. Okay, so this is what I do with the team, by the way. We don't spend more than a couple minutes. Tires and wheels. Anybody pick the next one? Brakes. Okay, what do you want? Mm -hmm. What would you like to pick? Brakes. Brakes? Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so I think we can, it's expected. You want to stop? <laughs> Same point. Okay, so debate about this persona. You want to suggest? What do you think? No, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pointing. It's kind of hard to differentiate the brakes versus the you know, brakes versus the brakes. Well, there's stopping distance, so th they could talk about it. So that's a safety factor. Um, also, some ways to feel what you're responsive. Yeah, on a test drive, you can usually feel the responsiveness of mediocre brakes, so you could feel it when you get in the car. Anyone else? Anyone? Anyone? Yes? So brakes don't they have some kind of option where it's like you can have maybe you can like do it for you and it's like you gotta bring it every time? Like it's not kind of easier. There is auto braking and there's a section, if you look at the backlog, there's uh, active safety. <coughs> so this is where you gotta how much how important is it for the car to take control of the driving experience. So that's that's uh, automation on top of the actual brake mechanical braking. That's another active safety feature. Um, so, all right, uh, anyone want to make it, make the, the decision? We got to make a decision and move. You're going to make it a must? Okay, we'll put it on a must. Next. Someone said linear, but we're going to make a decision. I'm going to put a risk. So here's one of the things we do, and I'll do it. Oh, hold on. Yeah, would you put a star on it? Just put a little star, and we'll come back. What will happen is themes start to develop, and things that may not fit the theme, you kind of mark, and you say, well, hmm, let's look at that again when you're done and see if the picture makes sense. Maybe it does. Okay, next. Yes. What do you want? Total cost? Yep, and so the total cost here is about insurance. It's about fuel. It's about depreciation, it's about thinking about what it takes to own the car, not just the price tag. Um, and that's why many things get high consumer rankings, right? Because they have low depreciation. Okay. Any, any questions? So we're going to say expected. Do you think that, again, look at the buyer. Do you think he's going to think about cost of ownership? Yes. yes. So it's expected. Okay. 
Well, I would, here's how I would debate this. And I'm not saying I'm right, because this, you guys have to make this judgment. I'm the guide here, not the person. You guys are making the product. You're the team, right? I would say, hmm, maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he does have a price tag he has to meet, but after that, it may not matter. There are, uh, when we're done with this, we'll talk about all the different car brands and what they do. If I can make it in and it depreciates fast, I have a fun car, I don't care. That could be a mode they are in. And you'll have to make a lot of investments in chassis and other things to, to make it a low TCO that you have to sacrifice other things. And so that's, that, that's, that's for the debate. But I'll let you guys decide. What do you guys think? Is it expected? So yes. So we're down here is does uh, lower TCO total actually uh, add more value? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and put it in linear. All right. Next, you can pick. Anybody can pick. You want to yell out because you want to find controversial. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> so this is about the expense on the plastics and is it leather? Is it cloth? Yeah, I, one example I talk about, uh, it, you know, you could have everything from mouse fur cloth to, you know, currency and leather ventilated seats. You know, family cars somewhere cut off before you get there, but you could start at the low end because that gives you more money to go spend on brakes. <laughs> So, how do we feel about interior? Expected, I'll go yes. So we're down back into our added value. Do you think that uh, more premium interior components will more likely sell this car? Yes. 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 Now, why do you think that? After it hits a certain level, right? You got to get a certain level. You got to play in this family sedan market. I got two small kids. They make messes. You know, s a smelly car because you spilled milk on your on your good stitching and ventilated seats does not feel good. And that's the reality of the you got a family that spills stuff, right? That's the family you're going after, and you're dri and you're driving like a sports car. Yes? Yeah, so you I think you're arguing for a must. You got a certain level and you're done. All right. In the interest of moving on, I'm gonna put it there and I'll talk about why that why that goes there. There are brands that live on this, we do performance on our interiors suck. Sorry, my language. Next. Ride and handling. Ah, here we go. So, uh, ride and handling. What do we think? So the normal family sedan, I would, uh, I could, well, do you wanna, you wanna throw out your, what yeah, you think? Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. But then you go up and you say, hmm, now you hit here is will giving them some, would that create value? Yeah. So you're, you'd argue it, it's, a, it's a potential delighter. Okay. It, 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 any arguments with that? Yes? The buyer. So, so this this is an interesting. It's an interesting nuance, and it's it's 
imperfection in, uh, like, you know, we're going into five degrees of freedom as opposed to one, right? And so here's where we get into a debate about are we using the benchmark as a family sedan market? And I'm going to say yes, where I'll agree with your assessment is if you're going out to the family sedan market, it's not, a, it's not, handling is not an expected item, but for this niche, you're going to say it becomes a potential delighter because he's been a sports car driver and he wants to continue to have that capability, have that, some of that experience. So I'll argue for a, del for a delighter, right, in handling. All right, I'm going to do a quick stop. Do you guys have a feel for what's going on here? Do you want to do more? Do you want to do a couple more? You know the list on the back. I'm happy to do more if you want. It just burns into where did this stuff come from and how does it really work when you actually use it? How many more? Two more? Two? OK. Anybody want to pick one? Yes. Uh, I think it'd be helpful to do like class of body. Yeah, Even sure. Besides, like, is it something you have to have or a must? Because I have had someone say, okay, tires and wheels. <laughs> like, all cars need tires and wheels, so why wouldn't that be a must? Yeah, so, uh, OK, let's go to chassis, and she'll find it. Um, so I'm going to say, yeah, you've got to have a chassis. And maybe I'm going to be the mechanical engineer guy, and maybe this is, it's easy for me to throw that on there. So. Um, you don't need much just to work <laughs> to be a good chassis. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You can do it uh, pretty quickly. But if it, it becomes um, better handling, better safety, the more resources you put into the chassis itself and pull away from things like interior and room, those are the things you sacrifice when you, I have actually have a whole chart of if you do a lot of one, what are you giving up? Typically, it's, it's not in the workshop we do that. But that's what I'll share with you is um, the chassis is the thing that everything bolts to, the engine bolts to, and the chassis. And I'll be frank, one of the things is they twist a lot when they're crummy, and they collapse easy when they're crummy, and you have to decide how much money you're going to spend and how much you can do enough just to make it safe, or you could do a lot more and make it so it handles great. Does that explain, I think, the conundrum? So it's going to definitely be a must. You expect to have a chassis, you've got to do one. And so does it have extra value? And I would say that if, you were going at, if we were going after a normal family, there is a level that's expected, it's safe, and then after that, they probably wouldn't, they wouldn't really care. And then I'm going to change that, and maybe this is, again, sorry, for those, I'm kind of jumping in, in a little bit, is, if you want a good handling car, you've got to spend more money on the chassis, and you're going to have to sacrifice in other areas of the car. So I'm going to go ahead. Rule apply to the brakes and interior quality then? Uh, there's stars on brakes for a reason, uh, because I think there would be, a, if we really had the time, we would be a disagreement about that. Um, and interior quality, um, that's probably what people, the industry tends to sacrifice interior quality when they do a better chassis. That's the decision they typically make. I'm, I'm just, so you have to say, okay, we're going to trade off. So for the interest of moving on, maybe I jumped in a little. Uh, I was too active in that one, so I apologize, because just because these are things that I don't expect you guys to, to know. We don't have the time to go to it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put the chassis as a linear because of the niche you're going after. Yeah. Yellow, colors, you know, big colorful palette, right, would be one thing that you could talk about. Uh, metal gold flake. Um, there are sedans out there that have bright, that are doing a great job of marketing. This is the Dodge line, to be frank. They have really loud engines and big motors, and they, they, uh, they say a lot. But guess what? Most families, not comfortable with that. So it's not, they're typically not purchased as a family vehicle. Does that, does that help? Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. And uh, let me go, let me be technical for a second. In, uh, so I help make and uh, guide uh, complex platforms. And um, everybody might like, you know, bring your own device and the freedom of using and doing whatever app you want to use when you want to use it. But there's somebody somewhere in the IT department who gets fired if 
data gets lost, right? And that person can kill things if he wants to. And so if you're making a platform for which there's someone who could get fired for something going wrong, he could kill it. And so that would be a potential uh, detractor. And again, it doesn't mean you don't allow some flexibility, but you got to figure out how that 1% of the population who hates what you're doing could actually do a lot of damage. Okay, one more. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, isn't interior quality something that could be a detractor? I, I know for a brand new team, uh, when we were looking, if it has like really nice rubber seats, that's a detractor to me because I agree with you. I don't want kids messing that crap up. I feel like <laughs> I, I feel like I feel like I kind of uh, argued that uh, you're right. I didn't want to drive that n nail too far. Uh, spilled, you want to feel good about getting in your car and smelling like sour milk because they, they poured it in, into the ventilated seats is not going to do that job for you, right? Just like the stitching will. So yes, it could be a detractor when you start going at the feature level. So it, it turns out that, just I talked about it, you could, this, you could use this tool at a portfolio. I've got several products I want to do. Or down in, even in, you, when you pick a linear, you can look at, well, there's a must level for the linear, and now let's talk about the different sections to get more and more. And you would go to a level on interior from mouse for a no to leatherette. Hmm, that sounds about right, because you don't care about it, to, yes, ventilated uh, seats may be a detractor. Do you want to pick one more and we get it done? Or are we good? Do you guys feel like you understand how the team could use this? Okay, we'll move on. Thank you very much. Uh, so oftentimes I put the cut line there because you do your diligence, you figure it out, and a bunch of things that are in the backlog, what happens is a bunch of things that you sent an engineer off to do that he thought he had to gold plate it, notice most of what we did fell into that category, and there's a cap to it where you help that person Realize that at some point you got to stop and move on to things that are actually adding even more value. So there are prescriptions that, uh, you know, because of the shape of that curve, that value curve. So I talked about how do you mitigate and drop the hostiles? How do you just get rid of the, the uh, indifferent, but make sure they're not a regulatory reason? They may not care, but there may be a law that you have to have it. Um, delighters are gold, you gold plate them. Strongly recommend, because of the history and getting something out there, you pick one. When you have a bunch of uh, capabilities, you actually typically find out you're actually going after different scenarios for different sub-segments. That's what I've found. I've had teams have at least three, and I've had as many as 20 delighters in a startup, because there's nothing, everything's new. And everyone's looking at a different delighter, and it ends up messing up everything below that supports it. Question? Uh, you optimize linears. Actually, you do an alpha, and you treat it like a must to make sure you have something that works. And then you learn how high it has to go to play in that market for a new startup item. If you're in an old standard market, you've got you to gotta hit some benchmarks that meet the market. And then... Uh, must is you go find out how you can min bar it. And this is where people like Sashiro Honda would recruit his Formula One engineers who were the most creative and give him horrible musts like fender liners and say, go come up with the cheapest way to do fender liners. And that's why uh, Detroit had multi million dollar injection molded uh, fender liners that ate up all the money and made crummy interior, and Honda's had waxed paper inserts that did the job. So I went ahead and filled, this is, this is if, I, if I did this with these, I said, I have a theme, it's performance handling, and these are the uh, performance and handling, these are the three things I wanted to do. Uh, this is my uh, delighter theme, go fast, turn fast. And these are the way I, I, I did linears. I'll let you guys take that in. They don't care about passenger room. Once you get a min bar on car capacity, they have a minivan. They don't need that. Um, they had to have good passive safety in crash zones. They had to get the stars, but once you did that, there wasn't any point in going any farther. And I'm happy to talk about it more. Now, 
I've done this several times. This is a list of the different kinds of vehicles that people have picked when they were not given this group, but they could pick who they wanted to go after. So they picked their persona. I'm still in the family sedan market, but they picked wildly different cars. They had everything from hybrids to what I, I picked today to something in between. Um, high technology for the interior, infotainment was a big deal. Uh, aesthetics, people wanted great styling, and so they, spent a they, they said, hey, I don't care about interior size, I just want it to look great. And if, uh, for every version of this, I can go show you a manufacturer who tried that for the family sedan market, because they had strengths. They were good, they had a competitive advantage in that skill set in their team, and so they used it. And that's how they, that's how they, they picked their niche, because they were good at infotainment. And they did that, and they knew how to do that, and so that's what they emphasized. So, principles. I'm going to, before I go in, any questions on what I thought I'd do is I'd go into uh, what is the concept here, and some of how it gets used, and what the impacts are. Sure. I was going to say, given your methodology, then you don't engage with your customer exactly. What do you do then? <laughs> um, I think it's exactly. Yes. Uh, what's I'll do it, because I'm, I'm Mike's, you're not. Um, when the team doesn't agree with who the customer is, what do I do? And so this becomes team therapy, right? And you saw earlier, th this sheet, this first sheet, I go, oh, and I make two. And I go, these are two different people. What are we gonna do? And by the way, the stack that we have is just a mess, because they've got them all together, and they've, they've judged them, and so you pull them apart, and then you rerun it with that finer, more precise version, and you end up actually restacking everything. So that's what I do, is like, I create that and say, you see these two? They're different, let's go do it. And it, after they've run through it, it, does, it takes just a few minutes, because they just go, oh, that's why. Question? Yes. Uh, yes. Can I, can I run through this part of it, an implementation? <coughs> Hopefully, if I don't answer your question, then, then we can jump in. Is that good? Yeah. yeah, okay. So, earlier I said, there <laughs> are proven problems that companies have. These are the five that, and how I think about them as a product manager at a tactical level. If you don't have good answers for these things, this is where the patient's not doing well. And so I ask these questions. And by the way, most of the time you hear about all of them is, do you know your customer? Do you understand how they value what they're doing? Are you executing aligned with it? Do you know the risks of failure or what, what are the things that most likely are going to get you? And how is your team aligned? Those are the things that I think about as a good product manager when I step in and go, what's going on here? And I, I don't just, I don't have them set to, I don't usually just say, whatever you want, I'll do it. I say, here's where you're ailing. Let's talk about fixing that. And this tool has come from seeing this issue over and over again, because the execution issue of aligning what you're doing ends up being the theme that I hear their discourse in the team and they're not clear and they don't understand. Now, what I hear and that it, there is the external targets are fuzzy and then the internal alignment is fuzzy because guess what? If the targets aren't, aren't clear, you can't be aligned behind them. And so it turns out that this Value assessment is the, I'm going to use a car term, the kingpin between getting the team to go from what's going on outside to translating to what they do. And that's why it's been quick and, and powerful and had huge impacts. So before this, this is the fundamentals of, of what is this assessment? What is this model is? You could talk about how high or low something was on a the absolute when you agree on zero is, which by the way, most people never do. And, or you could talk about the difference between them. Is something higher or lower? And that's just, we've had the conversation. You guys have purchased cars. You've purchased complex things. You know there's lots of options, and you go in there, and this is not how you think. You really do have to translate into this two-dimensional model, and this is how you think whether you know it or not. Uh, usually there's a savant on the team that has this in his head, and he comes up with a way people say, what, how sh what should I do with this? And so many, he makes a judgment call. And he's working through this concept of how do people feel if it's present and how do people feel if it's absent. 
And it turns out that when you do it this way and you do a big quant model, and this is a, a, a way to do it, there ends up being patterns, sorry. There ends up being patterns. And instead of doing a bunch of quant, you could just say, here are the circles, and that's the five types of value that, that I, I shared with you earlier, is they, when you plot it all out. These are the five things. There are circles where there's patterns and, and uh, features end up clumping into those areas. So just directly asking, does something fall into one of those clumps ends up being the quickest way to get a team to create a hypothesis for their lean process. Uh, I'm getting back to lean now. Is you use this, they create a hypothesis. You know your risks because you don't agree and you don't agree on the customer. And then you can get, start going instead of having to do some big quant survey. Um, again, I have teams that have taken a picture, uh, taken this and actually made a big poster and put it up their dev team above the, on the wall so that they could all get on the same page. Um, and to your sequencing question, so when I get involved with a team and we follow the um, prescription and say, hey, you're going to... Uh, value engineer something, you're going to come up with an optimum for what the linears are, and you're going to gold plate something. You actually, this is where I find out there are multiple, opt, multiple delighters and multiple customers, and I then go through it again. And once we decide uh, what the, I call it the minimum compelling offering, where I say it's a delighter, you pick the delighter and you rehash the stack to support that delighter. I've had, this is where my teams go from thinking they had to solve world hunger when it came to security, and they realize there's a non-customizable version where the security can be simple, and they cut six months out of their first delivery. Then they start building the flexibility into the product and worrying about the uh, capabilities. Actually, I'll, 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 uh, to your sequencing, uh, what I do is I, uh, the dev sequencing down the corner is I say, you got to min bar these. They got to be there. You don't have a product, so get these done. You know, make sure what min bar is and get them done. Then work on the linears. Uh, again, on an alpha stage, if it's a startup and there's a new market and you're disruptive, you can treat it like a must. But knowing you're going to have to do before you launch and get into the beta and farther, you're going to have to add something to be actually be satisfactory. And then you figure out what the gold plate is. So the, the Shiro Hondo mo uh, model was, you're not working on my engine, and we're an engine company, until you figure out how to make that fender liner. And that F1 engineer came up with, you know, he wandered off to the packaging industry and got a solution, and he got to go work on camshaft, which is what his dream was. To answer your question? So, whoops. And so the minimum compelling offering, again, I'll define that, is once you get these all up here, you figure out what the theme is, and then you just work to the theme and you rehash all of the linears and uh, musts to make sure they, they're even needed for that first release. And if they are, how little can you do before you start actually getting someone to use it? And a startup, I had a startup that had been at a project for a year. I knew the founder. He had seen me do some of this. He asked me to come in and help. And so after I did a little research, uh, I'm called, I call my company Gateway Adopters because I know who the person is who lives in the chasm on the adoption curve. I know what the indicators are to find them. And I did about a week talking to them, knowing what their requirements are and how they were different than the mass market. And then I had a team meeting and we used a decision tree. And he, his team felt they had to have a fully customizable solution that could uh, change, people could customize content and customize look and feel. And uh, during the conversation and ranking in a normal meeting where we just started putting things in delighter mode, they realized they had delighters where they could do stuff that was super simple, non-customizable, it accomplished and had value. And then they had one that was slightly customizable. It was graphics, not content. And this had both. And somebody was working on, the reason it was going to take nine months is because they had to do security for all this variability. And as soon as we knocked that out and said, Let, let's go see if this thing for gateway adopter personas has something compelling. Uh, people were using it in six weeks. They were using a, a non-customizable standard version that they were really happy with because it gave them a competitive advantage in their markets. Then we went and asked about this as our next step and they said, we don't care. 
doesn't have any value to us. So this team was going to do a march for three months before they had this capability, and they found out that the, the, the gateway adopters for their market didn't think this mattered. And so they moved on and did this. So I saved them about a man year. I got them revenue in, in six weeks instead of nine months, and then I saved them a man year of cost and so they could get to the thing that people really valued. And that was a 90-minute meeting. So these are the things that happen. Um, I showed you that kind of the five things that cause problems. This is kind of right at the kingpin of that from the inside and outside. You get a nexus of issues and you bring together who the customer is, the scenario, the features that your team is going to invest in, and um, the decision you're going to make becomes transparent. Everybody knows why they did it. When they leave the room, it wasn't some savant who kind of said, ah, go do this. You can put a title on the top of your feature. It says, this is a must. If you're going to go do this, the most imaginative way you can make that must you know, is the best. Um, and this is where the teams think about competitive advantage, right? What do I do better than the other people who are going to try to that solution out there? And you're clear about it. Um, and so because you have the prescriptions at each of the layers, you can align how much work you do with how, how much people are going to value. Um, you understand what the delighter is. The NCO concept says we know what we're gold plating and we know the things we're doing are to support that value proposition and that MCO so you can land it. And if nothing else, test it and find out it's bad. But it won't take long because you're really clear about it and there's no messiness. You don't have a bunch of things. You you're testing one thing and you can get that feedback. Um, again, streamlining work. And it's easy to adopt. Uh, the team that I was helping, um, like I said, I knew the founder and they listened to me and I showed up at their planning meeting, but other than that, they didn't know me and it was a normal meeting and in 90 minutes, we realized I helped them think through the different kinds of value and they, they are the ones that decided, oh, we can do this thing in six weeks and it's not customizable. I didn't tell them they needed to do it. They were creative people and with a new language, the test guy and the design person and the dev person could all have a conversation about, oh, wait, 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 we could do this thing that's not customizable without all this other underlying stuff. I didn't tell them that. So in a way, I'm this, this constant one-dimensional conversation that is not satisfactory and people, for good reasons, don't agree. The guy who thought security would take forever and the guy who thinks you can do something simple now have a language to have that conversation. Um, allows the team to up-level the conversation. And that's what I've seen over and over again is they suddenly, you're automating some things that have been really a grind and not been very effective. And now they can have quick and boom, they move on and they, and they don't spend a lot of time having to figure out how to come to a conclusion when they don't have the language to talk about it. Um, and again, everybody has their own vertical specialty. There's a design person with his language and a uh, the, each kind of dev and the test person, when you suddenly agree that this is a must or this is a linear, they can go apply their tools appropriately instead of having to figure out what's really going on and is this all gold-plated and they invest, the whole team invests accordingly. That, that cuts things down. Um, yeah, and, and so oftentimes a substitute for this lack of precision in the linear ends up being politics. So there's, I can't tell you the number of times I've gone into a team and the solution for being a good product manager is if you could buy the guy a beer and convince him you're a good person and da da da. Not create a clear concept of value that they could turn around and all agree on because they didn't have one. And so the only way you're going to get your way, your intuition was through good human skills, which don't get me wrong, they're really important. But uh, if everything is that, that means you're, you're missing something. You're missing some language that helps you guys avoid that kind of stuff. Um, again, it, 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 it can go in agile, it can go in lean, I don't, this is, this is the what, not the how, and so it just solves when you're asked, go define what it is you're doing, this helps you define that thing regardless of the model you're using for governing. Um, yeah, any questions? Uh, that, that's it, this is the impact it's having, like I said, typically, by picking one MCO, the team, uh, they get up and they walk out of the room all aligned, actually. I went back to the startup. After I did the, earlier I talked about the startup where we went from nine months to six weeks. I met with the CEO later and said, 
that was a huge change. When they walked in the room, they don't know who I am, and we have this conversation, and I'm challenging with hard questions. My fear, as the person who's trying to help, is they just said, yeah, who is that crazy guy? I'm not listening to that, and they went away. Right? That, that, that can happen. And so I met with him later, and his reaction was, oh, Patrick, I shouldn't tell you this. And I went, uh-oh. And he goes, when you walk in the door, it's a morale event for my team. Because when you leave, we know we're going to be aligned in a bunch of conflict that we had that were simmering are suddenly gone, and we know how to align and decide what it is we're doing now. So that uh, everyone in a nervous startup knows how they're going to go get the path to potentially getting money. They, don't, they know they're not guaranteed, but they know how they're going to land something, and they know why they think it's compelling. So those are the kind of things that have happened when I've helped my team. So this is how people have adopted it. It's a normal meeting. You walk through the decision tree and you put things and you suddenly have a language to actually <laughs> debate with each other with a whole new level and a cross function about what you're doing. You use the latest persona and this is where you start surfacing are we really the right persona? So oftentimes the compelling story is wrong or you have too many going at the same time or you, you are actually are argu arguing about the right, you're right about your thing but you're talking about a different persona and you get that out on the, uh, 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 and you apply it. You, then you implement the governance that is the prescriptions, right? Don't gold plate, you're not, not, sp not supposed to and if it isn't part of the MCO, wait. Put it on the next release and the next compelling component and I told you the story about knocking out a year as a dev and, a, and three months. Uh, <laughs> this is where, again, I talked about it earlier. So <laughs> I surprised a new groom. Again, wanted to be a good husband. Uh, he had to think about what he was doing in his life and where he spent his energy and time and how he thought about uh, clearing the table was not clear the table unless you got it in the dishwasher. You, that was the min bar <laughs> and you had to learn that the hard way. And uh, his wife really loved to socialize and he was an introvert. So he had to learn how to do things that weren't what he naturally would have done if he hadn't thought about it. Um, other fr friends did uh, a kitchen sink, uh, oh, I'm sorry, kitchen remodel. Uh, and others have done complete house remodels where they've taught, they've taught their builder and architect this so that they could uh, deal with new requirements. They ran into stuff that was just really not expected and so they had to figure out how they were going to meet their budget. Um, and at the portfolio level, I'm also adding a little uh, addition here is over time, things walk down the stack. When you guys are in the market now, months from now, if you're fast or years from now, these things will move from being a delighter down the stack. And you have to, t if it's fast moving market, you have to define it and you could actually use this at the product level where you're talking about each product. Okay, there was questions I'm happy to answer. I know we're out of time. No, I don't think so. Yep, um, I have time and like I said, I, uh, if you guys wanna hear of how, what the cycles were like and how I was able to identify what hurts and why we went here and what we did to develop the offering or this tool and others that have come up from this, I'm happy to spend time here. Yes? This will be a quick one. Could you sort of redefine succinctly like what linear does? So we're a little fuzzy. In yeah, uh, redefine what a linear is. L linear uh, is, is the two gates, very pedantically, is it's required, but after satisfying the, the need, more does perceive to add value. Considered it adds value. Adds value. Uh, that's why I talked about interior of your family sedan, right? It pays off at some. It, it, it lails off at some time. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, the layer cake is what I call it. So earlier we had uh, a question that said, well, what if your team is got different personas that you find out when you're doing it? Or they have different definitions of compelling. They have me several compelling capabilities. It turns out that they typically are actually going after different value props, that the themes that they were going are all mushed together and the whole team is, some people are aiming at this one and some people are aiming at this one and there's a bunch of discourse about 
you know, this guy thinks he's got to build uh, security that's, that can take anything, and this guy's just trying to get something that's uncustomizable out the door, and they're at each other's throats all the time. And so you define what it is, non-customizable, slightly customizable, fully customizable. This guy was happy after the conversation because he realized he had to do really sim a really simple version of security first. Did that help? Yes. So you probably heard about the uh, AWS story, right? AWS. Uh, sure. Some web services. Um, yeah. I just read uh, Jeff's letter to their shareholders. And uh, when they started AWS, they realized that customers do not know what they want. Yeah. Right. That was maybe 10 years ago. And then they built something. The first thing that they built is S3. And S3, you know, did not really pick up really fast, but then eventually now clouds is everywhere. So how does this model help shape when you, your customers, your customers don't do not even yep. know what they need? And so I think the, the way I have used it to help a team think about it, in fact, I'm helping a team now who's developing a platform. They think they have a platform and we're saying, well, what's compelling? It may not exist. And so what I do is I run through an exercise of what, what, is, what makes them write a check? What is the problem that you can solve? And then I have my team come up with delighters that aren't expected, that actually align with the market need that everyone's saying, ah, I'm not meeting my need. This particular team, for instance, their customers keep coming to say is, can we rev our app quickly without a giant pain? Nobody's got a solution for that. You know, so, but the customers say they want it. The flip side is they may not want it, but if you look at what their goal is, in this case, get apps out fast, maybe if no one's asking for it, you, your team can come up with a delighter that they decide to pursue. AR, VR has stuff like this a lot, right? Nobody knows what's compelling and what people will pay for. And so you have tons of ideas. In fact, that's the biggest problem I have with this or how I use this the most is they have 50 ideas about what you've been compelling. And so I spend my time saying, yes, this may be a feature, but what is the scenario problem that you're actually aligning with where you create value? So it's, 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 an, it's, it's the hypothesis for linear, right? You think, they aren't asking, but you at least have one. You had a question earlier. Yeah. When you go to a company, do you use a real life example from that company, or are you always using the exact question? Depends on who I'm engaging with. Like right now, my current engagement, they are, you know, they're wrestling with uh, trying to enter a new market and they don't know what they think can be compelling and I'm trying to get them to fill this top row in with things they think can actually fit it. And so we might go through what I call a tournament. There's a whole nother, people come to me, I got 50 ideas, I don't know how to pick the best one and brainstorming sucks. It does, it guarantees to kill, re good hardy scientific research, you kill the best ideas if you do brainstorming. Um, and there's lots of good reasons. So uh, what we're working to do with them is a tournament model where we come up with Olympic-like three criteria that people know what the outcome needs to be, you know, the criteria for what the goal is, even though they don't have an idea for it. And then you do A-B testing and then throw out the score and A-B testing and throw out the score and you work through the brackets. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, uh, some, I know people want to leave, and you, you're welcome to leave. What I, if, you're, if you'd like to stick around, the thing that I would, I get more excited about than this tool, because I have 50 of them, is how do you walk into a situation and figure out which tool to pick and get better at using that tool when you keep finding the same ailment? So that's the next handful of slides, and unless you guys are going to kick me out. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, sure. All right.